It's time to do something different. Lexus thinks that in terms of its presence in the full-sized executive saloon sector. And if you're looking for a car of this kind, you might well be wanting a change too. Now this car, the Lexus ES, sets out to provide just that. And we're gonna test it. Four generations of GS Saloon have represented the brand in this segment since 1991, all of them rear-driven, just as the brand thought uh, Mercedes E-Class, BMW 5 Series and Audi A6 segment buyers wanted. But the GS was expensive to build and it couldn't provide the price advantage over the Teutonic competition that Lexus really needed to make headway in this class. For three decades, the company has had a model line on its books, better place to do that. But the reasons why have prevented the model in question, this ES, from ever being sold in Europe. Put simply, the ES model's engineering has always been more affordable because much of it has been shared with the humble Toyota Camry sedan that US buyers love so much. Uh, this side of the pond, Lexus has always based its model range around cars that differ far more fundamentally from their Toyota counterparts. It's taken until now for the design of the ES to suit our continent in that way, or at least that's what's claimed here. Actually, this seventh generation model still shares plenty with the Camry. Uh, not only its GAK platform, but also the 2.5 litre self-charging hybrid engine, which sets this Lexus apart from the diesel models that still dominate this segment. But much else is different, notably the suspension, uh, refinement, cabin design, and of course, the exterior styling, which takes its cue from some of the brand's most eye-catching recent shapes and should make quite an arresting statement in the office car park. Is all that enough to genuinely make this the credible full-sized executive saloon that its model letters designate? It'll need to be if it's to play its part in Lexus's ambition to double its European sales over the next 10 years. At the time this car's launch in early 2019, over 2.3 million ES models were already pounding global roads. Worldwide, in fact, this is the company's second best seller. But the Mark 7 design is larger than any of its predecessors and it's more dynamically orientated too, despite its front-driven format. Plus, it's more affordable, better equipped, and safer than the old GS ever was. All of these are attributes that this car will need if it's gonna convince BMW, Audi, and Mercedes buyers disillusioned with diesel that an ES might represent a fresh start in their motoring journey. Can it do just that? Well, that's what we're here to find out. It's always good when you stick to what you're good at. Now, since the early 90s, Lexus has been plying its trade in the full-sized executive saloon segment with its uh, rear-driven GS model. Now, that car, particularly in its hybrid forms, was partly a laid-back Lexus and partly a copy of the more dynamic models that premium rivals offer in that segment. And perhaps, inevitably, it ended up being neither one thing nor the other. So, the brand has stopped listening to people telling it what it ought to offer in this class and in this ES it simply delivered the Lexus take on what a car of this kind should be. As you might expect, uh, the people who think a car of this kind ought to be able to handle like a sports saloon should the need arise don't like it at all. But these are rarely the people who actually buy or use full-sized executive sedans of this kind. Uh, those who do tend to be drivers who we think will rather value the luxury, refinement and efficiency that this car sets as its priorities. If you think that's just a polite way of saying that this model wafts affordably about but doesn't handle very well, well, that's not quite accurate. Uh, that was true of the previous generation ES models that Europe didn't get, but this one is cut from a different cloth. Its Camry connection is one you might have heard about. Toyota's large saloon does indeed donate its 2.5 litre self-charging hybrid engine to this car, but it also shares with it a stiff, sophisticated GAK platform that gave Lexus's engineers uh, the perfect starting point to create something different. Uh, they further stiffened that base and then fashioned a unique body to sit on it, formed from much stronger ultra-high tensile steel. Huge amounts of extra sound deadening and 
and tougher bonding were incorporated for extra refinement and a bespoke patented swing valve shock absorber arrangement was developed uh, in an attempt to set new standards for passive damping suspension. Those sophisticated shock absorbers use an ultra low velocity valve with a special oil flow system which makes sure that exactly the right amount of damping force is provided to match the slightest movement of either wheels or suspension. And sure enough, uh, the result is ride quality that's generally very good, although we have found that it does occasionally shudder a little over really poor surfaces, uh, slightly spoiling the feeling of calm. Now it's at this point that you might think it's uh, rather a pity that Lexus doesn't offer any kind of optional air suspension setup to further improve things, uh, the kind of package that would suit this car rather well. Now you can have adaptive damping, or as Lexus calls it, AVS or adaptive variable suspension, but only if you go for the mid-range F-Sport model. We're not sure we'd bother. Uh, the F-Sport version doesn't have any more power, and although the AVS setup does allow you to drive with a touch more focus, you still wouldn't keep a well-driven 5 Series E-Class or A6 in sight on a fast, twisty road, nor would you want to. As we've been saying, this really isn't that kind of car. Unlike the old GS, it drives through its front wheels, which means it has to use the brand's 2.5-litre four-cylinder hybrid power plant. That's the only unit offered to buyers in our market. Uh, we would have liked to have seen the further option of the more sophisticated 3.5-litre uh, V6 hybrid found in the company's larger rear-driven LS and LC models, which has an advanced twin transmission setup to try to eradicate the rubber band effect that usually afflicts Toyota and Lexus hybrid engines that are mated to belt-driven CVT gearboxes. Uh, specifically, it's the issue that throttle stabs result in soaring revs but not much uh, appreciable forward motion. Now, Lexus says that it's worked on that problem, but our experiences in this test suggest that they still haven't got anywhere near to eradicating it. Uh, as a result, overtaking manoeuvres really will need to be planned with more care than you'll be used to if you're moving into this car from a much torque diesel model in this class. We should talk a little more about the 2.5 litre hybrid engine, which might appear at first glance to be the same unit as the one fitted the brand's older IS and NX models, but which uh, for this ES is actually an all new power plant. It features a redesigned transaxle transmission made up of an electric motor, a smaller motor generator and a more sophisticated version of the usual eCVT belt-driven automatic gearbox. Uh, the hybrid setup's battery is supposed to be new too, although it still uses old-fashioned nickel metal hydride cells. Total system output is 215 bhp, that's about 20 bhp more than obvious diesel powered segment rivals like the BMW 520d or the Mercedes E220d, but that's misleading. Uh, the key stat here is that for pulling power and with just uh, 221 newton meters of engine torque, this ES has about 40% less of that than most obvious premium diesel rivals, which is why, although the quoted rest to 62 miles an hour figure is 8.9 seconds, this car doesn't actually feel anything like that fast. The maximum velocity, meanwhile, is just 112 mph. At lower speeds, uh, as with most full hybrids, this car can trickle along powered by the 245 volt battery pack only, as it will from start off, or with just the engine if you're giving it full throttle, or more usually with a combination of both. And that's something that you can monitor via a selectable energy monitor display on the infotainment screen in the center of the dash there. Um, and unlike, say, an old Honda hybrid, you don't have to have that combination approach if you don't want it. Um, as long as the engine's warmed up, pressing this EV switch uh, down here by the gear stick will keep the car in all electric mode from anything between a few hundred meters and just over half a mile, provided that there's uh, enough charge in the battery and you keep it below 25 miles an hour. Uh, once you do need to use the engine, you get the usual hybrid benefit that uh, power which would otherwise be wasted when you're braking and decelerating can be used to charge the batteries that drive the electric motor. 
Once the engine has cut into Dominate Proceedings, it'll be a case of making the best selection from the Drive Mode Select system. Uh, it's a setup that works when you twist this rather curious control on the left-hand corner of the instrument binnacle, uh, tweaking engine output, throttle response and uh, change times between the six virtual ratios of the ECVT Auto Gearbox, operable rather pointlessly with steering wheel paddles. Uh, the default setting is normal if you want to leave the software to do its own thing but otherwise you can select eco for efficiency or sport for performance motoring that comes with the accompaniment of a red tinged hue on the instrument panel ahead of you. If you have an F-Sport trimmed ES model fitted with the AVS adaptive damping setup we mentioned earlier, then drive mode select will also alter suspension feel and you'll additionally get two more dynamic settings to play with, Sport S and Sport S+. Plus. But as we keep suggesting, if you're hustling this Lexus along in the kind of fashion that would make those modes relevant, then you're rather missing the point of it. Um, although if you ever do, you might, like us, be surprised that mid-corner body control at speed is quite assured and the steering is actually rather fearsome and direct. Better though to throttle back and just enjoy refinement that's in a different league from diesel rivals. Tire noise on rougher surfaces is the only thing that you'll really notice on the highway, which is when you might want to try the standard adaptive cruise control system. Now that incorporates lane tracing assist technology, which offers at least a degree of so-called level two autonomous driving capability, although you will have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times. That kind of tech is of course common in this segment, but the opulent refinement of this ES isn't. Now sure, to get it you have to make a few dynamic compromises, but in return you're rewarded with a model delivering the kind of luxury that you might expect would be limited to larger boardroom level saloons. Uh, this is Lexus back to doing what it does best, and if you like the thought of that, then you'll like this car. The looks of this car will be a major determining factor in making people want to try it. Quite a bit has been borrowed from the Lexus brand's top boardroom level luxury saloon, the LS, and that's a good thing in our book. It gives this ES a car park presence that German rivals struggle to emulate. It's longer, wider and slightly lower than the old GS model and it's considerably bigger than the previous generation ES designs that our market didn't get, none of which were large enough to be credible, full-sized executive saloon rivals to key European players like BMW's 5 Series, the Mercedes E-Class and the Audi A6. This seventh generation ES very definitely is, and in profile, its increased size is very evident. And nearly five meters in length, it's actually one of the lengthiest contenders in the full-size part of the executive class. 36 mils longer than an Audi A6, for example. Uh, this, along with the rearward sloping fast roof line and the lower bonnet line enabled by the new GAK platform, combined to deliver a sense of gravitas and street side status that this model line never previously had, with a silhouette uh, styled around what chief designer Yasuo Kajino calls a theme of provocative elegance. And to suit the current trend, it's all set off by large wheels, 17 inches on the base model, 19 inch rims on the F-Sport version, and an 18 inch design on this top Takumi model. Now this being a Lexus, the detailing is almost obsessively intricate with elegant bars that radiate from the center of the brand's signature spindle grille. That's a feature redesigned with a unique cross-hatched look for the more dynamic F-Sport model. Either way, the ES makes quite a rear view mirror overtaking statement. Uh, the flanking corners feature slim LED headlights incorporating tick-shaped daytime running light strips. This top model gets them in the triple I adaptive high beam form that uses an array of 24 individual LEDs which automatically adapt their light pattern to suit surrounding traffic and road conditions. The rear end is clean and sharply chiseled with LED lamps that wrap around the quarter panels to generate a continuous styling line when viewed from any angle. 
Again, the F Sport version gets a few more dynamic touches, a boot spoiler and a bespoke lower rear bumper balance, but even the more conventional versions are classily finished with chrome finishing around the corner reflectors and twin exhaust outlets. But does all this tinsel merely clothe a humble Toyota Camry, as critics claim, and as was largely the case with previous generation ES designs? Well, yes and no. Uh, we mentioned the GAK platform. That is basically the same as the one the Camry uses, and sections of the body and white are shared too, as of course is the engine, but pretty much everything else is different. Uh, the chassis and bodywork feature lighter, high tensile steel, while aluminium has been used for the bonnet and for the front wings. All of that is bonded with stronger joining techniques, plus there's extra chassis bracing and much more soundproofing. While in addition, uh, the suspension is also broadly bespoke to the ES with its patented swing valve shock absorber technology. And of course, the cabin is very much Lexus's own, as we're about to find out. It's created around a concept apparently inspired by ometenashi, the Japanese art of hospitality. Sounds ridiculous, works a treat though, based around a seat in control approach designed to ensure that from the moment you get in, all the controls you need are within reach and all the information you want is in plain view. Every rival will claim this too, but you might well find that the way that this Lexus goes about achieving it to be refreshingly different if your middle management motoring life so far has had a Teutonic theme. Uh, the sweeping stylized lines, the arguably more unique choice of trimming and texture. Oh, and the seats, uh, they're really very good indeed. Three years in design with superb shaping and subtle depressions in the cushion surface that allow smaller occupants to enjoy the same level of body support as larger people. There are further expressions of individualistic design in the distinctive instrument binnacle. You view it through a classy three-spoke wheel that's borrowed from the larger LS saloon, which, although it is a touch over button, feels great to hold. Now through it, you might expect to view a display with the kind of fully digital instrument gauges, which are now common in this segment, but Lexus prefers this single dial-shaped TFT screen, uh, the colour and graphics of which change depending on your choice of drive mode. Uh, it's blue and white for eco, white and red for sport. It's flanked by conventional needled readouts on the right and by a little screen to the left which has selectable options for fuel consumption and trip computer info, plus an energy monitor and a tyre pressure graphic. Uh, everything you need, in other words, uh, not that you'll have to look at all of this very much if you have an ES that's equipped with this head-up display, one of the world's largest, a jet aircraft-inspired 24-inch projection that can show far more detail than rival systems. Almost too much, in fact. Bright yellow arrows for potential hazards, sometimes flashing up to embellish the usual speed and navigation info. Perhaps inevitably though, there are also design elements here that don't work quite so well. Uh, the binnacle top stitched cowl is lovely. The horn style controls sticking out of either side of it aren't. Now, as in the LS and the LC, these just look odd and they're a bit of a stretch to reach. Although the dial style settings they offer for the driving modes on the left and for traction control on the right work well enough. Uh, the surround view camera system has the most unrealistic graphics we've seen from such a System in ages. And rather more significantly, we just don't understand why so many of the functions of the brand's Lexus navigation package have to work via this fiddly touchpad down by the gear stick, which is almost impossible to use properly on a bumpy road. And it's generally much less intuitive to use than the simple circular dial that you'll get with a rival BMW iDrive infotainment setup. Fortunately, you do get a little rotary controller and some proper buttons at the bottom of the center stack to operate the audio system. And there's a proper CD player nearby. Now, that's a feature that's becoming increasingly rare in modern cars. Um, as for the other infotainment functions, well, accessing those via this maddening touchpad is for us still better than having to stab it away at a touch screen as you would have to do in a rival Jaguar XF. And it's also better than fiddling with the haptic touch sensitive dash buttons that you have to use in an Audi A6.
Uh, this top uh, Takumi ES variant gives you this huge 12.3 inch center dash display, but lesser versions get an 8 inch screen, both a little incongruously flanked by a little analog clock. The bigger screen, which is available as part of an option pack on the F Sport, is certainly nice to have. Uh, the sheer size of the monitor makes up for the fact that you can't replicate the navigation mapping graphics into the instrument binnacle as is possible in rival models. And although its graphics don't have the detail and crispness of rival Teutonic setups, they are clear and effective in dealing with all the usual destination, navigation, uh, radio, media, Bluetooth phone and climate functions. Uh, various apps can be downloaded via an incorporated e-store, but it's uh, extraordinary that the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems aren't available, and that's even as options. Lexus does have its own interface for this called Miracast, but it's more restrictive. Another case of being different for the sake of being different? Well, you can't help but think so. As mentioned earlier though, quite a lot of the efforts at differentiation are very welcome. Uh, the stitched dashboard, which looks a little plain on the base model, comes alive when it's fitted with these lovely uh, Shimamoku trim inlays and it features vents with an intuitive style of output, courtesy of the Climate Concierge system. Now this uses infrared technology to monitor the body temperatures of all the car's occupants and it adjusts the climate control settings to suit, even taking into account factors like sunlight shining into one side of the cabin. Uh, something else that's uh, distinct to this Japanese brand is its Mark Levinson audio technology, uh, standard on this top Takumi model and optional on the mid-range F Sport version. It uses 17 speakers installed at shoulder height at seven points around the cabin, plus two nine-inch elliptical woofers on the front doors and a powerful 265 millimeter subwoofer, the largest ever installed in a production Lexus. If there's a finer sound system on offer in this segment, then we haven't heard it. Even the setup's aesthetic attention to detail is pleasing. Uh, the visible speaker grills are finished with an organic pattern inspired by the veins of a leaf. Build quality from the Japanese factory is faultless and little touches like the natural lever creasing on the lidded top of the storage area between the seats also impress. Although if you look hard enough, you can find lower quality plastics used in various places uh, around the door bins and in this deep cup holder bin behind the gear stick, for example, which brings us on to stowage space. Uh, this covered flap in front of the touchpad rises to reveal another cup holder, a little compartment and twin USB ports along with an aux in point. Uh, for a 12 volt port, you have to look in the uh, deep covered bin between the seats I just mentioned, which is also where the wireless charging mat will be if you've a uh, trim level that includes that. Uh, neither the door bins or the glove box are particularly large, and Lexus has forgotten to include an overhead sunglasses compartment, but you do get a little storage cubby uh, down by the driver's right knee, uh, recesses in the door pulls, and ticket slots on the sun visors. Finding an ideal driving position on these superb electrically adjustable seats is pretty easy and it's aided by standard powered steering column adjustment too. Uh, some of our taller testers though would have liked to be able to position the chair a little lower and preferred the extra cornering support offered by the more dynamically designed seats fitted to the F Sport model. Uh, forward visibility is fine but your over the shoulder view is rather compromised by the sloping roof line and by the narrow rear window, which is probably why all-round parking sensors and a reversing camera are standard fit features. Time to try the rear. Now earlier we mentioned that this ES is one of the longest cars in the segment, but somehow Lexus has managed to translate that into a design with the shortest wheelbase in the class. That, along with the fact that this car also has the lowest roof height in the sector, doesn't bode well for back seat space.
Once inside though, legroom isn't too bad. Lexus says that there's actually only a millimetre less than you'll get in the boardroom level LS saloon that competes in the next class above, although that car is poor in that regard. Uh, that slightly restricted ceiling height necessitated by the sloping roof might be an issue for taller passengers, but cabin width is average by class standards. Uh, there's actually more of it here than you get in a Mercedes E-Class and accommodation of a third person, if needed, is helped by this reasonably low centre transmission tunnel. Ideally though, there'd just be a couple of you back here, in which case you'll be able to pull down this centre armrest with its incorporated storage area and its twin cup holders. On this top Takumi variant, it also includes the controls for the electrically reclining uh, seat back and for the rear seat heating. Those are both features exclusive to this top level of trim. Uh, you can also control uh, other premium Takumi features like the powered rear screen shade and separate controls for the climate system and the front infotainment setup. It's the kind of luxury that you'd think would be restricted to much larger, super luxury, director level saloons in the next class up. Even lesser ES variants though are pretty nice back here with twin vents and classy stitching on the door cards and the front seat backs. Plus connectivity hasn't been forgotten. You get a 12 volt, 120 watt socket alongside a couple of 2.1 amp USB ports. Uh, there are also sprung seat back pockets, decently sized door bins, uh, recesses in the door pulls and on this Takumi version, pull up side window shades too. Finally, let's take a look at luggage space, an area that in the past with hybrid Lexus saloons has tended to be compromised in size. For this one though, the brand's designers were able to work with a more compact nickel metal hydride battery pack featuring a 120 millimeter reduction in height and a more compact cooling system, which in turn meant uh, that they could relocate that pack under the back seat rather than in its usual position in the boot. Has it helped? Well, let's see. Uh, for the electrical booter operation we have here, you have to have opted for top spec Takumi trim. Uh, you get foot operated functionality too, which is useful if you're approaching the car key in pocket loaded down with bags. A little disappointingly, given all the design changes just mentioned, the space revealed, which is accessed through a rather narrow opening with a significant lip at its base, is actually 11 litres less than the old GS 450H hybrid saloon model offered. Uh, you get a 454 litre capacity, which, although it is probably quite sufficient for most likely owners, is quite a bit down on what you get from obvious segment diesel rivals. For example, it's 76 litres down on what you get from an Audi A6 or a BMW 5 Series and 86 litres less than a Mercedes E-Class. Still, this space is notably wide and decently long, so it's pretty usable. To that end, a four chromed tie-down hooks are provided, along with a couple of bag hooks, and there's a small, deep stowage area under the floor, which doesn't provide anywhere to store any sort of spare wheel. For longer items, a ski hatch is provided. Yes, even if you have a Takumi variant like this one with a powered reclining seat back. But it is annoying that the folding seat backs you get on other saloons in this class can't be offered here. That's because of the two metal braces that Lexus felt the need to incorporate into the body shell to stiffen it. One ring shaped and the other V shaped. So trips from Ikea with flat pack furniture are out. You might be relieved to hear that though. The ES range is pretty straightforward. Uh, this single saloon body style and three levels of trim, standard ES, F Sport, and the top Takumi version that we're trying here. Uh, under the bonnet, our market gets just one petrol electric self-charging hybrid engine option. Uh, we're not gonna be offered the conventional petrol engines which are available in other world markets, not even for a hot performance version, which Lexus has no plans for. Uh, unlike the competition, the majority of ES buyers will be re retail customers and these people will find that ES pricing starts at around £35,000. Uh, for the F Sport derivative you'll need around £38,000 and for this top Takumi variant you can budget at around the £46,000 mark. 
The ES model range sits in the Lexus lineup just above the only slightly smaller BMW 3 Series sized Lexus IS saloon, which uses a less efficient older generation version of the same 2.5 litre self charging hybrid engine and will only save you around £3,000 on an ES. Your other main option within the Lexus lineup as an ES buyer is the brand's NX mid sized SUV, but that also uses that older generation hybrid engine. It will set you back around £1,000 more. It has a a lot less rear passenger space and it costs significantly more to run. You've really got to want an SUV to ignore all those issues. Of course, the fact that uh, Lexus doesn't offer ES buyers an estate body style, a performance variant or a diesel engine is obviously going to limit this car's market penetration. But you still can't help thinking that the package that's available here would tick a lot of boxes with plenty of buyers in this segment particularly given that it undercuts direct diesel rivals so significantly. They'd have to be diesels really to get anywhere near this car's efficiency stats. Uh, a conventional petrol competitor would be way off and there's no other non-plug-in hybrid model available in this segment. Uh, this car's hybrid drive systems, 215 HP combined output, positions it most directly against class contenders like the Mercedes E220D, uh, the BMW 520D and the Audi A6 4 TDI, all of which cost three to four thousand pounds more. A Jaguar XF 2 litre D 180 PS is more affordable, but it'll also probably carry the same kind of price premium if you equipped it to a similar standard to this Lexus. In theory, there are other options in the class, but few potential buyers consider them. Volvo's S90 is a rare sight on our roads, and it would cost around £3,000 more than an ES in equivalent D4 diesel form. Or you could get a Gran Turismo-style five-door model like Volkswagen's Arteon, which costs around the same in base diesel auto form. Or the Kia Stinger, which in diesel auto guys costs fractionally less. Critics of this car would say that actually its closest rival is the Toyota Camry it shares much of its engineering with. Uh, one of those would save you around £5,000 over this Lexus, but you can't imagine a typical Lexus buyer ever considering that Toyota. Waitrose folk don't shop at Tesco, they just don't. Otherwise, as just mentioned, this ES is unique in its provision of relatively affordable full hybrid power in this class. Uh, the Audi A6 offers engines with mild hybrid assistance, as many other competitors shortly will, but that's not at all the same thing. And the Mercedes E-Class can be had in an E300e plug-in petrol hybrid form, as can the BMW 5 Series in 530e form, but those cars are very pricey indeed, pitched at around £47,000. Ultimately then, what it all boils down to is that if you currently run a full-sized executive saloon with a diesel engine and you want to switch to something comparably priced that's more eco-friendly with similar running costs, you might find it hard to look past this Lexus. And if that is the case, then a high level of standard spec could make a decisive difference. So let's see just how generous Lexus has been in that department. And let's start with the base ES version. Now this will probably be the uh, marginally the best seller in the range because it offers the lowest CO2 reading, which is because the wheel rims used, the 17 inches, are the smallest in the range. Um, even at this base point in the lineup though, you still get several features which rivals would charge you extra for, things like a sunroof, heated front seats that are eight-way power adjustable uh, and electrically adjustable steering column and uh, a reversing camera too. Plus, of course, there are all the more expected features you'd want from a car of this class. Uh, things like LED headlights with an automatic high beam, LED rear lamps and Tahara man-made leather seat upholstery, along with a dual zone climate control setup, which incorporates a nano humidity sensor and a lovely climate concierge feature, which orchestrates the ideal climate for each person in the car. Uh, you also get auto headlamps and wipers, all round parking sensors, driver seat lumbar support, LED ambient lighting, a rear seat ski hatch and an anti-theft alarm with a mobiliser. And there's plenty of glass stuff too, a water repellent coating for the side windows, privacy shading for the rear sides and the screen and an acoustic heated windscreen. Plus there's a drive mode select driving mode system which allows you to alter steering feel, throttle response and gear change timings via eco, normal and sport mode settings. 
Infotainment is taken care of by an 8-inch Center Dash multimedia screen with a remote touch interface. That's your access point for a 10-speaker Pioneer audio system, a Lexus navigation setup, and media options that continue to include the fitment, which is now rare in this class, of a CD player. Uh, there's also Bluetooth and a DAB tuner, of course, but what you don't get, which will be a source of irritation to some potential buyers, is Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone connectivity. The Lexus Toyota Corporation really needs to get on board with that technology. If you can find around £3,000 more than the sum being asked for the base ES variant and you're sold on the idea of owning this Lexus, then there are two choices. Uh, the first is to equip the base version with what the company calls its premium pack, which adds to it some key extra luxury features, smooth leather seat upholstery with front seat ventilation, larger 18-inch alloy wheels, a powered rear screen sunshade and triple I LED multi-weather headlights with an adaptive high beam system. Plus you get some extra camera-driven safety features we'll come on to in a few moments. Or if you buy into the brand's assertion that this seventh generation ES can be what none of its predecessors were, a genuinely sporty saloon, then you might want to simply opt for the next step up in the model range hierarchy, represented by more dynamic F-Sport trim. Now here, the exterior look is subtly different with a boot spoiler, a bespoke lower rear bumper balance and bigger 19 inch wheels. Uh, there's also a different look for the ES model range's signature spindle grille, which sees that front feature made Made up of interlocking L shapes set within jet black metal plating that's also applied to the rear combination light surrounds. Uh, the interior is bespoke too with grippier F Sport seats, an aluminium sports pedal set and unique Hadori aluminium inlays apparently inspired by the fine traditions of Japanese sword making. And you get power folding mirrors along with a memory function for the driver's seat and steering wheel. More significantly the F Sport variant is the one that you have to have if you want the drive mode select driving mode settings to be able to alter suspension feel. That comes courtesy of an additional AVS, Adaptive Variable Suspension Package, which brings it uh, with a couple of extra drive settings, Sport S and Sport S Plus. Today though, we've gone for the very top of the range and the plushest Takumi model. Here you get all the features that you might really want. The softest semi aniline leather upholstery, a 360 degree rear camera and wood interior inlays created in a Shimamuku style by the brand's Takumi master craftsman. Backseat folk are much better looked after. With Takumi spec, uh, they get heated and power reclining rear seats, plus their own climate control options, courtesy of triple zone air conditioning. Uh, there's a powered boot boot lid that you can raise with a kick of your foot beneath the bumper and a much larger 12.3 inch screen for the Lexus navigation system. Plus you get 18 inch wheels, a card key, a wireless charger, a head up display, a powered shade for the rear screen and manual shades for the rear side windows. Oh and there are the triple I LED adaptive high beam multi weather headlights that you have to pay extra for elsewhere in the range. Possibly our favourite Takumi spec feature though is the thumping 17 speaker Mark Levinson's surround sound audio system which offers concert hall like sound reproduction. That's partly because the speakers are positioned at shoulder height to enhance the acoustics and partly because of a clever quantum logic surround feature and partly because of the use of the setup's Clarify 2.0 technology which plays sound as close to the original recording as possible. On to options. Now, refreshingly, you don't get pages and pages of these, as is the case with more established premium rivals. So we can keep things relatively straightforward here. Uh, now, we've already covered the optional premium pack, which is available on the base ES. Well, the mid-range F-Sport version has a couple of bespoke option packs too. If you've chosen that variant, a payment of £700 more gets you the tech and safety pack. Now, that gives you a wireless charger, a heated steering wheel, and those triple I LED adaptive high beam multi weather highlights we keep talking about. Uh, alternatively, if you want to add uh, the luxury of the top of the range model into an F Sport derivative, then you might be persuaded to find £4,000 more for the Takumi pack, which will equip you with a lot of the flagship version's extra features the larger 12.3 inch Lexus navigation screen, a head up display, the powered boot lid with kick sensor, and that superb Mark Levinson sound system. System. Plus, there's a powered rear sunshade. 
Otherwise, there's not much else to spend your money on. Bear in mind that unless you want your ES finished in solid black, that's the only standard color, you'll have to pay extra for metallic paint, like this particular car's mercury gray shade, or a lot more for one of these special metallic paint shades, sonic white, uh, sonic titanium, or azure blue. Uh, you might also want to add in illuminated door scuff plates and a protection pack. Uh, practical extra cost touches include a rear bumper protection plate, uh, door handle protection film, wind deflectors and rubber or textile floor mats. For the boot, you might want a bespoke mat or a vertical cargo net. And if you haven't kicked the habit yet, uh, an ashtray is available. On to safety stuff, uh, you'd expect a proper large executive segment saloon to also go large when it comes to cutting edge camera driven safety equipment. And the ES does, courtesy of the standard inclusion of the brand's Lexus Safety System Plus Pack, which includes six key elements. As you'd expect in this day and age, one of those is autonomous braking. Uh, Lexus calls it a pre-collision safety system, one of those that scans the road ahead as you drive in search of potential collision hazards. Now, if one's detected, you'll be warned. Uh, if you don't respond, or perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Now, the setup has recently been improved with increased sensitivity and dynamic range, so it can cover daytime cyclist detection and nighttime pedestrian detection too. The other five Lexus Safety System Plus features can be quickly covered. Uh, lane Keeping Assist warns dozy drivers who've drifted over delineating lines on the highway and helps them back into lane. Sway Warning sounds an alert and displays a warning if steering input, lane positioning and vehicle sway suggest that the driver's fatigued. Traffic Sign Recognition pictures road signs on the move and then displays them for you on the dash. And Automatic High Beam remotely dips your headlights for you at night. Uh, there's also adaptive cruise control. Now that will automatically keep you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway. Uh, and it also incorporates lane tracing assist technology, which offers at least a degree of so-called level two autonomous driving capability. Although you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times. Of course, safety isn't only about camera-driven tech, although you would be forgiven for thinking that these days. It's probably equally relevant to note that this seventh generation ES model's much stiffer GAK platform and tauter global architecture structure makes it significantly more crash resistant than this design used to be. And just to make sure, the cabin features no fewer than 10 airbags. Uh, there are twin front, side and knee airbags, rear outer passenger side airbags and curtain shield airbags to shield from splintering glass and window intrusion. Plus, as you'd expect, there are features like a tyre pressure warning system, ice fix child anchors on the two outer rear seats, head assist control and the usual electronic assistance for traction, stability and braking. If you want more, then opting for a premium pack equipped version of the base ES or this top Takumi model also gets you two further camera driven features. A blind spot monitor that works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another car and a rear cross traffic alert system uh, which will warn you of an approaching vehicle when you're reversing out from a parking space. Now earlier we also mentioned uh, the adaptive high beam headlamps that you get with uh, option packs or on this top Takumi. Uh, they're really worth having. They use an array of 24 individual LEDs and a system that can automatically adapt the light pattern to suit surrounding traffic and road conditions. Uh, this hybrid is of the self-charging, non-plug-in kind, which is why it's so much cheaper than German hybrid rivals who only offer plug-in technology. Importantly, it's also slightly cheaper than the most obvious premium conventional diesel competitors. And that makes this Lexus ES theoretically an ideal option for a private buyer or a company manager wanting a more individual choice in the large executive saloon segment. Uh, a car that projects the right kind of eco-minded image. 
All three variants have an official quoted WLTP combined cycle fuel economy return, officially rated between 48.5 and 53.3 mpg. It's more important though to look at emissions. Now here we're trying the top Takumi variant on 18 inch wheels, which manages 103 grams per kilometer of NEDC rated CO2. Uh, the mid-range F Sport version on 19 inch wheels manages 106 grams per kilometer. The base ES derivative runs on slightly smaller 17 inch wheels and that reduces the CO2 reading to 100 grams per kilometer. All of this translates into an impressive benefit in kind taxation showing. Um, base ES and top Takumi versions of this car have a BIK rating of 24%. Uh, for the F Sport it's 25%. Now to give you some perspective on that, uh, the rate for a comparable diesel rival would be either 30 or 31% which is why a 40% taxpayer company driver would save between five and six and a half thousand pounds in tax payments if they were to run an ES over a three year period rather than a comparable Audi A640 TDI, a BMW 520D or a Mercedes E220D. Will all this be tempting for likely buyers? Well, that rather depends on their perspective. Now, some may point out that something like a BMW 530e with plug-in hybrid tech is, according to official figures, able to deliver up to 128.4 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and emit only 49 grams per kilometer of any DC graded CO2. That's quite a difference. In response, Lexus points out quite reasonably, one, that those official figures aren't even close to being realistic pointers to what you get in day-to-day -day motoring, uh, which is true. Two, the cars like that BMW and a comparable Mercedes E300 E cost more than 30% more than an ES. And three, that surveys show that most owners of PHEVs often don't even bother to regularly plug them in. Now, arguably, without that electrified element, a plug-in model might be even less economic than an older tech self-charging hybrid like this one, arguably. Anyway, you can debate all this until the cows come home. Let's say that you've decided that you like this ES and you want to justify its purchase. If so, then we'll help you to do that by pointing out that this 1.75 tonne piece of oriental hybrid powered real estate is as economic as 1.1 litre Fiesta and much cleaner. To more relevantly put its fuel and CO2 figures into class perspective, uh, a comparable diesel powered rival, say a 2 litre Audi A6 40 TDI, manages 62.8 mpg on the combined cycle and 117 grams per kilometer of CO2, which is about par for the course in the segment. In other words, if you switch from a black pump fueled model in this sector with this Lexus, you'll lose a little in terms of economy, but that'll be compensated for by the cheaper fuel you'll be putting into its 50 litre tank, and you'll gain a lot in terms of your emission status. To get anywhere near the fuel figures being quoted here, you'll need to keep the car locked into the drive mode select system's eco mode, which moderates throttle response and engine power output while tweaking the climate control. Uh, at highway speeds, this setting also lets you coast with the engine off, which saves more fuel. Uh, throughout all of this, you'll also need to keep a very careful eye on the hybrid system indicator, which replaces the usual rev counter on the dash, uh, making sure that the needle stays as often as possible in either of the blue eco or charge zones. Of course, during much of your urban motoring in this hybrid Lexus, uh, say when you're inching along in traffic with the engine seamlessly disabled and battery power in motion, uh, you won't be using any fuel or emitting any emissions at all. Plus, it helps in this respect that uh, cold weather operating efficiency has been improved with the brand's more recent hybrid technology. Now, that means that uh, whereas previously a chilly morning might have seen the drive unit default straight to the petrol engine, on startup, now it's uh, rather more likely to revert to the preferable electric mode as you glide out silently into the traffic. And that's a pretty cool sensation in a car of this kind. At higher speeds in an ES300H, you'll need to bear in mind that the quoted fuel figures are even more heavily dependent than normal on the driver, assuming a significant degree of restraint, uh, certainly to get anywhere near even the 40 miles per gallon mark in day-to-day -day use with the hybrid version of this Lexus. Uh, you'll need to keep the car locked into the drive mode select system's eco mode. Uh, now that will moderate throttle response and engine power output uh, while tweaking the climate control. 
Uh, you may also want to keep an eye on the useful graphical fuel consumption display, uh, which is provided as part of the infotainment system's info section. Uh, now there are trip info and past record screens, so you can gauge your ongoing success in fuel economy and energy regeneration. What else might you need to know about running cost issues? Uh, well, buyers may need reminding that petrol electric Lexus models no longer qualify for free congestion charging. And on the subject of taxation, the Takumi and F Sport variants attract a VED annual road tax band of F. Uh, for the base ES model, it's band E. Essentially, you're looking at around £130 a year for the entry-level derivative, which represents a very modest saving at around £10 a year over a comparable diesel model's VED figure. Uh, bear in mind, though, that because this top Takumi model's list price is over £40,000, it attracts a £310 VED surcharge for the first five years of ownership, as will an F-Sport version equipped with the Takumi option package. Residual values are expected to be a couple of percentage points behind obvious diesel rivals, but they still look pretty healthy. They're predicted to be between 41 and 46% of original value after three years. For comparison, the old GS model managed between 37 and 44% in its lifetime. Remember too that when you're considering depreciation, uh, an ES is better equipped than many of its rivals. To match this car's spec, you'd have to spend extra cash on options with those cars and that's money that you'd be unlikely to get back at resale time. Where Lexus could do better though is in the warranty it provides. Although there is a five-year package to cover the hybrid engine, uh, every other part of the ES package has to be covered by an unremarkable three-year 60,000 mile deal, which doesn't seem overly generous in this day and age, as particularly since parent company Toyota offers five-year cover on its models. Um, you can, of course, pay extra to extend that cover, but in our view, you really shouldn't have to. But does that matter? This is, after all, a Lexus, a car in which market experience suggests virtually nothing is ever likely to go wrong. Uh, the facts are that hybrid technology generates fewer warranty claims than conventional petrol or diesel engines do. And if something ever should happen, so charming and helpful are the award-winning dealers in the network that you may end up being almost glad that it did. Uh, that is just as well, because uh, you're gonna have to be visiting them relatively often Often for routine maintenance. Uh, servicing intervals are every year or 10,000 miles. That's a bit more frequent than we'd ideally like, although a prepaid servicing plan can keep costs in check. At least the cost of those garage visits should be surprisingly low thanks to the low maintenance requirements which are built into this car's hybrid synergy drive system. As part of this, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, uh, no drive belts to break, a maintenance-free timing chain, no particulate filter to get clogged up with fumes, and of course, thanks to the CVT automatic gearbox, uh, there's no clutch either. The hybrid setup has a good record for minimizing tire wear and its battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the regenerative braking setup helps to extend the life of the brake pads. Uh, let's finish with insurance. The entry-level ES model is rated at Group 33E with the S-Sport version pitched at 34E and this top Takumi variant are rated at Group 38E. Car magazines will tell you that most buyers in the full-sized executive sector expect a highly tuned degree of handling finesse from their saloons, which of course is rubbish. The average business buyer of a car of this kind wants comfort, luxury, and the lowest benefiting kind taxation position possible as part of an exemplary low running cost proposition, all of which the ES delivers better than any other contender in this segment. No, you can't throw it around like a 5 Series or even an Audi A6. The hybrid electric drivetrain can still be frustrating when instant acceleration is called for. And yes, there is a slight whiff of Toyota Camry in some elements of this design, but it's very well disguised. And anyway, that's what enables this contender to offer significantly more advanced engine technology than its diesel rivals for a significantly lower price. Start to drive in a way that suits both the car and the engine and you'll quickly start to understand why a small but loyal band of owners like this ES so much. 
The very things that limit its driver appeal contribute to its relaxed refinement and unhurried sense of elegance. And if you've got to the point in your life where those attributes start to really appeal, then maybe you're ready for a Lexus. Perhaps even this one. Uh, from a Lexus point of view, this car does rather marginalise the role of the slightly smaller IS saloon in the range, but that's, uh, that's their problem. If you're choosing this segment, then yours is whether you'll continue to select a full-sized executive saloon based on the choice you've maybe always made and perhaps some sense of perceived sportiness. If not, then the ES has quite a case to make. One thing's for sure, if you're after the most rational choice in the class, then you're looking at it right here.